Good morning, everyone. Uh, good to see you here on the first Sunday after Easter. Well done, all the diehards that made it out today. Remember, midweek services do not rack up so you can skip afterwards. So yeah, no, nice to see everyone here today. Uh, actually, this morning, we're starting in the season of Easter a new sermon series. It is called Modern Problems and Ancient Solutions. And today, as we do that, and we do that periodically, just so uh, if you got a, a, it's printed in your bulletin and on the bulletin board. Uh, in case you have a friend that's interested in some of the topics coming up, bring them along with. It's an easy way to invite people to church. And this morning we're looking at the modern problem of seeking after happiness. So my prayer for you today is that in God's word, which will be both spoken and sung, that you might walk away uh, from worship this morning invigorated once again with the joy that comes with our relationship with our Lord and Savior. Uh, we'll follow the order of service as you have it printed for you in your bulletin um, and we'll begin by joining together in great is thy faithfulness but before we do that let's just greet one another as we've come together as a family of Christ this morning I know we got a few new faces so please introduce yourselves and and make sure to say hi to our visitors and we also have a, a few lost sheep that have wandered in Judy and and Woody are here uh, uh, yeah so not lost sheep I'm just teasing you but yeah uh, back worshiping with us this morning it's good to see you here so let's greet one another in the Lord Let's uh, lift our voices in praise to our Lord this morning in hymn number 602, Great is Thy Faithfulness. 602, Great is Thy Faithfulness. You'll find that in the blue hymn books in Christian worship. In the blue hymn books on the back of your pews, hymn number 602.
follow the order of service as you have it printed in your bulletin. Please stand as we join together in our opening responses and our confession and forgiveness. This morning we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed are they whose sins the Lord does not count against them. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done and have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. Take just a moment of silence for meditation. Well, the good news of the gospel is that God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all of our sins. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be our redeemer and savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. Let's join together in singing our praise to our Lord in the words of glory to God in the highest. Let us pray. Dear Lord, this day we come into your house to worship you and to praise you. We pray that you send us your Holy Spirit, that it might fill our hearts and our minds, that we, we might walk away with the assurance of our salvation and the power to live a life for you. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Uh, you may be seated. At this time, we'll turn our attention to the words of our Lord on this second Sunday of Easter. Our first lesson is from Jeremiah 17, 5 to 10. This is what the Lord says, Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see 
They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure who can understand it. I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson is 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9. Praise be to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. The inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genesis of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel lesson is from John 15, 1 to 8. I am the true vine, and my father is a gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you, Mr. Barnett. At this time, I'd ask for the children to come forward for a message intended especially for them. Good morning, everyone. Oh, does it, do you have school next week? Some of you do, some of you don't. Yeah, okay, all right, that's, uh, yeah. Spring break is coming slowly. Well, good to see you here in church this morning. Uh, we're starting a new sermon series, and we're looking at problems that sometimes we face in our life. And today we're looking at the one of, of happiness. Now, it's interesting, though, because our gospel reading, Jesus gives us a really cool illustration. And, and let me show you, I'll put it in a little more modern terms, but let me show you what he meant. So you'll notice that we got a lot of flowers around the church this morning. Those are, you know, for the Easter season. Let's suppose that as scientists, we want to examine those very closely. And so one of the best ways is just to look and see what it offers. And, and I brought a lamp along in order so we can get a really close look. Like maybe there's bugs in there, or maybe they're falling apart, or we can see the stamen, or all the little different parts of the flowers, right? So let's take a look. We're going to look over here. All right. And we'll just turn this lamp on in. What? You have to plug it in? What do you, you mean this doesn't just work without it being plugged in? Hmm. Should I try that? I got to unwind it? Like maybe this extension cord over here? Oh, <laughs> look at that. Someone put that right there for me. Okay, let me see if I can plug it in. Um, okay, and let's see if it will work. 
Now, you guys are really smart, and I got it. Okay, good idea. That is a possibility. Thank you, Ayanara. Okay, so should we try it? Oh, no, it still didn't work. What else do I have to do? Uh, I think I have to turn the switch on. Okay, now do we have light in order to study the plants? Yeah, okay, that was a pretty easy lesson. I was trying to fool you by saying we we're going to study the plants. What I really wanted you to do is to realize that in order for a light to work, what do you have to do? You've got to plug it in. It's got to have power from someplace, right? This is pretty obvious. Yeah. And you've got to turn on the light switch, which allows the electricity from the plug to come to the extension cord and then to the light. Now, Jesus didn't have electricity back in his day, but notice what he said. What's that? No, but look at what he says, though. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. He calls himself the vine, and he calls us branches. Can this branch live if it's not connected to the tree? No. Eventually it's going to wither and die, right? Yeah, you got to put it in some sort of nutrients to grow it. Yeah, if I grafted this into a tree, which you can do that, you can cut it out and stick it in there, would the branch then grow? It would, right? In the same way that a light doesn't work without electricity, so a branch can't grow unless it's connected to the roots. Yeah, now Jesus calls himself the vine, and we're the branches. What does he mean by that? Yeah, in order for us to live, in order for us to grow, in order for us to flourish, we need to be connected to Jesus. Now, here's the beautiful part. Does a branch get to decide what tree it grows on? No, it just grows on that, right? Yeah, and then it's fed by that tree. In the same way, you guys were chosen by the Lord. You were tucked into his tree. You were given faith in him, and he strengthens you by us being connected to him. Tell me, how do we connect with Jesus so that we continue to grow and flourish? Prayer, the Bible, right? And knowing his word, yeah. Yeah, so now think about that. I know sometimes we say our prayers at night and we read our Bible stories and we think, ah, oh, yeah, it's something we're supposed to do. No, the reason the Lord does it is because this is how we grow and stay strong in our faith. All right, this week, if you guys haven't gotten into the regular habit or bug your parents about it, say your prayers at night. And don't forget to read a little out of the Bible so that you might know what the Lord's will is for you in your life. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord and Savior, thank you for bringing us to church today. Thank you for making us a branch from the vine. And thank you for strengthening us in your word. Bless us, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, thanks for coming up. Anybody want my branch? Oh, Carson said it first. Sorry, Arna. I'll get you another one. We'll go outside behind the church. I'll break another one up. All right. This morning, we're going to lift our voices in praise to our Lord. Um, we're going to uh, uh, switch it up a little bit. We have been learning a psalm of the month because psalms are great to sing through. We've gotten to the point where we know quite a few psalms, so we're going to sing a different psalm every week this month. And the one that we're going to look at today, which is a great one for this Sunday, is Psalm 141b. You'll find that in the gray hymn books, not the blue ones, the gray ones, uh, on page 766 and to 768. Uh, it's Let My Prayer Rise Up, hymn, or Psalm number 141b on page 766. Now, we've sung this one before. Some of you will remember it. Jump in if you remember it. Uh, don't let the bottom line confuse you. We're not going to sing this one in parts. We're just going to sing the top line with the three verses and the refrain. So let's jump in and sing together, lift our voices to our Lord in him. Uh, Psalm number 141b, Let My Prayer Rise Up.
Uh, my family in Christ, good to see you here this morning. We're starting up a new sermon series on ancient, uh, ancient solutions to modern day problems. And today we're going to look at happiness. We're going to run through this for the next couple of months, actually, and you'll find our list of topics that we're going to go through in the bulletin. With a couple of exceptions, uh, don't forget next week we actually have uh, Vicar Jacob uh, Kieselhorst, who is a pastor in training, is going to come and deliver the message for us and lead congregation in worship. So if you want to know how baby pastors are formed, he'll be a good example about how that comes about. So he's a, he's a great kid. Uh, he's in his third year of seminary, and this is kind of an uh, apprentice year. So he's working at a church out in South Carolina. He's going to come uh, for next weekend to preach down with us. We're looking forward to that. Uh, but this morning we're looking at the, the, the problem of happiness. There has been, most historians would gather, a, a, somewhat of a shift in the last 200 years on what we look to solve our problems with. Uh, after the Age of Enlightenment in the 1800s, we, and it's not a bad thing, but we, we decided that we would look a lot at the, at the outward externals like uh, medicine and science and biology in order to come up and solve some of the problems that the world has. And we would look inside. Uh, we would also try to look at uh, psychology, sociology, and understand ourselves better to address some of these problems that the world has. And honestly, in the last 200 years, it's worked to some degree, right? We, we, don't, we aren't afraid of famine uh, on a day-by-day -day basis in, in the Western world. In fact, it's the opposite. We eat too much, right? Uh, we're, we're not concerned with the major diseases that have affected the world uh, to a large degree. We've, we've gotten those under control. We've, we've abolished slavery, right? These are good things that have come. And yet the question sometimes remains, and we can judge this, are we happier than we were of uh, people that lived 200 years ago. And one of the ways that we can judge this is we can look at journals and things that were written uh, 200 years ago to see the contentment of people in their lives and compare that to today. Now, I, I don't have to make an argument to whether we are more happy or we're not happy, but I, I kind of get the feeling that we haven't solved that problem of, of happiness. And all it does is you just take a look at the suicide rates that we have in the United States, unprecedented. We are, I just saw this statistic, the most medicated country in the world when it comes to depression, right? And even I, I think the attorney general, or the, the, the surgeon general said that one of the major issues that's going to affect healthcare in the next 10 years is clinical loneliness, right? Isn't that crazy in a world where we're so connected? So, and I think it's a fair question to ask. Are we, even for those of us that have gathered here this morning, are we happier than those that lived before us? One of the reasons I think it's an important question is because sometimes when it comes down to it, the, a lot of the decisions that we make in life are based on whether it makes us happy or not. Think about it. Just about everything that we do the advancements in science and medicine or industry or uh, inventions, the vacuum cleaner, the cell phone, whatever it is, are, are meant to make our lives easier and make it happier. And even marketers have tapped into this. I don't know if you remember this one from Coca-Cola a while back, but they had a marketing campaign and they showed someone opening a bottle of Coke and it said, um, open happiness, right? Your life begins here. I'm not quite sure how you connect that with a bottle of Coke, but Apparently, there's people that aren't happy when you open a bottle of Coke, then you become happy, right? So this, I mean, it's a real thing uh, when we look at it. And I think that part of the problem in, inherent in a world that looks to science and psychology, and I'm not saying those things are bad at all, but part of the problem in a world that looks to those is, is modern solutions for modern problems. We have a tendency to disdain the ancient. A, a lot of cultures hold on to their ancient traditions or the things from the past. We don't always like to dig into those. So what we're going to do this morning then is take a shift or a focus. If we haven't solved the problem of happiness, let's look at maybe the only ancient text that many of you go to, unless you like the Iliad and the Odyssey in very old Latin and Greek. Um, we're going to look at Psalm 1, which is uh, uh, over 2,000 years old. And the wisdom that the Lord gives in us as he talks about uh, happiness. Are you happy? That's the question I want to ask yourself. Fundamentally and consistently happy. And if I ask your co-workers or your kids or your spouse if you were happy, what would they say? Let's take a look at it. And here's where the Lord answers us. He gives us some guidance in his word. And he answers the question this way. Are you happy? 
be a tree. Okay, let me explain. Psalm 1. I'm going to read through Psalm 1. I apologize. I did not have and print it in the bulletin if, if you want to, and I would encourage you to do it. Find a Bible, or feel free to open up your phone. I will assume you're not browsing on Amazon, and if you'd like to follow along with Psalm 1, please do so. And we're going to jump into it. This psalm is maybe one that you already know um, that you're familiar with, a very popular psalm, one that introduces the book of Psalms. So let me read Psalm 1, beginning at verse 1 down to verse 6. Here's what the psalmist writes. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his, de- on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the ways of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. So far the word of God. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, strengthen us in your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. All right, the psalmist really uh, ends up answering three major questions for us, and, and they're this. Can we be happy? Why aren't we happy? And, and then the last one, so how do you continue to be happy? All right, the first question may seem a little simple. Can we be happy? And I, I would imagine that maybe this depends on the point, point that you are in your life. When you're long, young and very vibrant, the answer is, of course, you can be happy. You just, if you work hard enough, you can do it. And this is kind of the answer that we often get to happiness, right? If I do the right things and I do them long enough and I'm willing to do them, I will be happy because I will have attained the things that I want, it, it, either owning a boat or a good career or a family with 2.4 kids or whatever it may B, this is something that I can attain if I work hard enough and I do it long enough. Yes, of course I can be happy. This is natural for human beings to be happy. The the flip side of that, and tell me if this is true or not, is that sometimes then, when you look at people who aren't happy, what do you assume? Well, they must not have done something right, which could be the case. They, They must not have been in the right situation, which could also be the case. But something is wrong. Their happiness depends on them. We just watched a show the other night where the lady was saying, I deserve to be happy, so I'm going to do all this stuff, right? So, I mean, this is a common way to think. I think on the other side of the scale, however, you also have people, and maybe deep thinkers, that say happiness is impossible to gain, right? So you get old and crusty like me and, and you know your kids are happy because now they have a full-time job and are making money. And what do we say? You better save it up because there's a recession coming. Don't be happy about having a job. We, we don't quite say that, but right? We say, well, there, life isn't always enjoyable. It's not always great. And you have to prepare for these things in these difficult times. And so sometimes I think on the other side of it, we, we, maybe, we maybe also assume that no, at some point in our lives when we haven't been happy, we realize, uh-uh, happiness is not natural. In fact, it's impossible. And I think that maybe we reflect this even within our culture. I mean, just take the movies and the shows that we watch. Everybody loves a comedy. Um, we, we watched Ted Lasso and we laughed and laughed and laughed. And it's great because we need that break. But usually it's a break from reality. People also love the Titanic, which is not a comedy, right? Yeah, this is something that is serious and it's a tragedy. And when you look at them, the Titanic tragedy is real. This is real life. This is history. Ted Lasso is just fiction. And so even in our lives, we realize that, yeah, we probably are drawn towards the tragedies because we feel that this is normal part of life. Uh, I just heard an article the other day. You heard the Bitcoin guy got thrown into 25 years in a jail. I can't remember his name. Uh, But there was another story about another guy that decided that um, he had lost a whole bunch of money. And so he was really, really sad. And so he decided that instead he would go out and commit a couple of crimes and got caught for it. And now to make himself feel better or happy. And now he's thrown into jail as well, right? See, th- th- this is kind of the reality of life. And I think, and I could be wrong on this, but there's really four categories that a lot of times we fall into when we think about happiness. N- number one, it's natural. 
if I work hard enough, I can get it or I deserve it. Number two, it's impossible. There's nobody by the time you reach the end of your life that's really going to be happy. Or number three, which I think a lot of us fall into, we distract ourselves so much that we don't realize either the fragileness of life or the, or the difficulties of life. Or, or maybe, number four, where we go to our Lord and, and he gives us this insight from ancient literature that says happiness is not connected to the gaining of stuff, but rather to a relationship with the Lord. Look at Psalm 1, the very first verse that, that the psalmist writes, and he says, blessed is the one. And even if you just stop there, the Hebrew word for blessed is actually plural. It's happinesses. And, and the idea is it shows up over 45 times in the Old Testament. It shows up in the Sermon on the Mount. It's in the book of Revelation over and over again. And this is idea that people can be in the state of happiness, right? This is a beatitude in which it says you are a happy person, happy upon happy. It's not a benediction which wishes you to be happy. Literally, the psalmist is saying you can be happy consistently. That is a radical statement, right? So why aren't we? Why aren't we happy in our lives? I think one of the reasons, and here the psalmist brings it out in verse 2, 3, and 4, is too often we look for happiness in the external things. We're trying to gain happiness by gaining something. Look at, look at what the psalmist says. He said, blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. Now those are all active verbs and what it's saying is there is something that is happening in order to be blessed. How does our culture pitch happiness? I mean, generally, if you watch the marketing, how are you supposed to be happy in this world? Is blessed is the man who gets a new fishing boat and don't don't take me wrong, I would love a new fishing boat, right? But blessed is the man who has a great career. Blessed is the man who, and you can just fill in the blank. But then what happens when you don't have those things? Then it becomes miserable is the man. See, we, we have been fooled into thinking that if we are looking for happiness, it can be found in the external things. It, it, it's something that we can gain or earn and that we can have, and once we have it, then we will finally be happy. But what the psalmist is saying is this. He said, we are looking for happiness in what we gain in, in the externals. This is, this is what we do. But if we sacrifice our relationship with the creator who made us, if we sacrifice our relationship with others around us in order to gain happiness, then we have lost those externals. Really what the Lord is saying is it's not in the externals, but happiness is a byproduct of a relationship with your Lord. This is, this is why the psalmist talks about uh, righteousness. Everybody thinks it's good to be righteous, right? Everybody thinks it's good to have a high moral standard. We consider ourselves good people. Raise your hand if you've ever been thrown into jail. No, no, don't raise your hand. I'm just kidding. But for the most part, these are all good things until it's a matter of our happiness, all right? Uh, illustration, personal story. So we went into an all-you-can-eat, and you know that when you bring your family into an all-you-can-eat, this one happened to be everybody under the age of 12 is free. So your daughter, who is uh, 14 and fairly short, is along with you. You walk into the restaurant, and the waiter says, are all the kids under 12? And what do you say? I said, yes, they are, because you know what makes me happy when I'm a dad of three? Money in my pocket. That's happiness, right? Yeah. And... I said, yes, we are, um, uh, to which my children, because you know what makes your children happy, embarrassing and calling out your dad, who is a pastor, as a hypocrite, in front of the waiter, raised their hand and say, no, I'm 14, right? Yeah, we, we are willing to sacrifice our righteousness if it brings us happiness. And in the pro process, we lose happiness and the relationships that we have including with our Lord. See, here's the problem, and, and this is why we believe that lie. We've been cut off from God. We have been broken. Our relationship is not there, and when we only look to ourselves to bring happiness, we don't get anything. But if we connect and go to our Lord, we get it all. And, and this is what the psalmist means. How do you hold on to happiness? This is a radical statement which Christianity offers, but it is given, not taken. It is given. It's not found. 
And here's what he says. But who's, the blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That a person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Yeah, here's the answer. God says happiness is being a tree. Now think about it for a second. A tree does not get to choose when it exists or when it doesn't. It comes from a seed which is dead. A, seed, a tree does not get to choose where it's planted. Somebody else does that for you. And so the Lord is, is calling us the same way. He's saying that we are dead in our sins. He has taken us. He has planted us. And what he has done is given us life and put us in a spot where we can continually grow and nurture that relationship with him. See, he shows us something that you don't find anywhere in the world, but only in the ancient literature of the Bible. And that is happiness comes as a byproduct of knowing your Lord and your Savior and walking with him. Happiness comes from knowing what our Lord has done for us. Happiness comes from the righteousness that Christ has given to us, not what we have grabbed it or taken. This is the grace of God. And this is why over and over again, the last verse in Psalm 1, he says, for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. We're not righteous, but God has given us and restored that relationship by giving us Christ's righteousness. So he's talking about us. That's the problem with seeking externals in this world. If you're looking to find happiness in what you have or don't have, if, if you only find happiness when you get your way, if you only find happiness where things are going well, if you only find happiness when, when this is what you have, you, you lose that happiness. But if we have this relationship with our Lord and are connected with Him, happiness comes as a byproduct. Whether good things or bad things happen in our life, this is the tree whose leaf does not wither in and out of season because we are connected with the one who created us and redeemed us and continues to strengthen us, right? So it comes down to that one question again. Are you fundamentally a happy person? And if you're not, how do you get that way? Well, here's what the author says. Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. Here's your application. Now that word law needs to be understood properly. You probably know if someone is telling you to do something or don't do something like your spouse or your family, it's not something you delight in, right? You don't say, oh boy, I'm so glad someone told me not to touch that, right? Understand what the psalmist is saying. The word in Hebrew is Torah, which means a broad definition of meetings. It can mean the Ten Commandments, the first five books of the Bible, but the uh, basic meaning is instruction. What the Lord is saying is that the person who delights in the law of the Lord, the message of the Bible dwells on it day and night. And that message is this. Your life was won because someone else lost their life and it was given to you. And that someone is Jesus Christ, right? The delight in the word of God comes from not, not knowing all of the facts. It, it, does, it, it doesn't come from just studying it day and night as an academic pursuit. It's not something that simply you have to have sitting on your coffee table, but rather looking at that word of God and knowing that Christ has given his life for us to delight in that as we are a delight in God's, in God's world. So let me give you one tip. If, if, if you haven't dipped into that law of God, into that word of God, it's not surprising if your delight is not there. So try it. This week, this month, this year, do nothing more than take a psalm every day Read it through. Set your timer for five minutes. Think about what the Lord is saying to you that's worth delighting in. Talk to your Lord and delight in God's word and the message of salvation that you have. Friends, be a tree and be blessed. Amen. Please stand. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. This morning, as we've come into the house of God, let's confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. And we'll do that by joining together and singing that confession. You'll find that on page 8 in your service bulletins. Let's join together in singing, uh, We Believe in One True God. You may remain standing as we sing this service.
Okay, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Please stand, and then we'll join together in the Lord's prayer after we go to our Lord in prayer. <clears throat> we pray. Oh Lord, our God, what great and wonderful blessings that you, you have truly prepared for those who love and trust your Son. We pray, Lord, that you would give us such love and trust that we, through your Son, Jesus Christ, may know all of the blessings that you have in store for us. Lord, as trees, let us continue to tap into your word that we might delight in your message of love and acceptance that you have given to us. Dear Lord, we also come before you as trees go in and out of season through difficulties and hard times, and we place into your hands all of those that could use an extra special dose of your grace. Lord, we ask your blessing on Alex Arobu, who is in the hospital, and on their, his family as he continues to recover. Lord, we ask that you would continue to watch over Charlie Furtado and Heather Bear uh, as they continue to treat their cancer. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would watch over Kathy's brother, Vincent, as he has open-heart surgery tomorrow. Guide the doctors and the nurses as they continue uh, to do all that they can and provide special extra sense of grace to all of those who are struggling. Lord, we pray for all of those bat battling with sickness and disease. Lord, watch over all of us within your congregation. But today, Lord, we also come before you and praise you and thank you for the blessings that we have seen that you have put into our lives. We thank you for members like Mary Trapp who has found a church home in Wisconsin. We thank you for the members that come and grace us with their presence, like Judy and Woody. We thank you, Lord, for the friendship and the love that we share in this congregation and with others around the world. We ask, Lord, that you would make us truly appreciate the blessings that we have. We praise you, Lord, that April has finished her cancer treatment. Continue to watch over her and help her to be cancer-free. And above all, Lord, we ask that you would pull us closer to you in our faith, strengthen the sick, support the weak, supply the needy, and show yourself a very present help in every trouble. Lord, we come before you this day confident that our prayers are heard through your Son, Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's join together in the prayer our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated. This morning let's lift our voices and sing our praise to the Lord one more time. In the words of I will sing of my Redeemer, hymn number 527 in the blue hymn books. Hymn number 527. Let's join together in singing I will sing of my Redeemer. <clears throat> 